In Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and verse 17, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it, the gospel of Christ, is the power of God into salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein, where? The gospel. For in the gospel is the righteousness of God revealed from faith unto faith. For it is written, the just, the righteous, shall live by faith. Barna Research Group did a survey among those who claim to be Christians. Nearly one third, they claimed, of all born again Christians stated that all good people will go to heaven, whether they have embraced Jesus Christ or not. 42% believe that while on earth, Jesus sinned just like other people. 61% believe the devil is just a symbol of evil, not a living being. 54% think that if people are good enough, they will earn a place in heaven regardless of their religious beliefs. I guess this is why when we go to a funeral home, Everyone goes to heaven in the minds of people and in what is said. All of these things are so far from the truth. If we go back and listen to the words of Jesus that we studied a couple of weeks ago, we know that we've got to hear Jesus Christ. We know we've got to believe in him. We repent of our sins and confess him before others and be born again of the water and the spirit. And then as we studied last week, three conversions in the book of Acts and what they were told to do to be saved. All of these things contradict what so many people believe in the world today. Today, we're going to turn to the book of Romans. And if you have your Bibles, I hope you open them up. And we're going to look at the road to salvation that Paul shares with us in this epistle to he wrote to these brethren in Rome. There is a Roman road that leads to heaven. It is not one of those roads that was built by Caesar's workmen. It is not posted on any one of the 53,000 miles, say, of roads that Romans built. You will find the Roman road to heaven clearly marked in the book of Romans, the sixth book that we have in our New Testament. The theme of the book is found in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. The theme of the book is the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Gospel means good news, glad tidings. It was a term used in everyday language at this time. But Paul specifies what good news he is referring to when he wrote this letter. It is the good news of Jesus, verse 16. In Romans chapter 1, verse 1, he used the term and he stated that he had been separated unto the gospel of God and was ready to preach to them that were in Rome. What was he ready to preach? The gospel. Verse 15 of Romans 1.1. 1, 1. The gospel of God would have to do with the origin of the gospel. It did not originate with the apostle of Paul. He had been separated under the gospel of God. 
Peter stated in 2 Peter 1 verse 16, as we looked at last week, for we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And A.B. says, we did not follow cleverly devised myths. Another translation says, we did not follow cleverly invented stories. They were not fables. They were not myths that we have made up. We were eyewitnesses of the fact. The subject material of the gospel concerns Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter 1, verse 3, it says, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. God separated me into the gospel. This gospel concerns his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. The gospel message centers, hinges on, on Jesus. Paul also refers to the gospel as being the gospel of peace. In Romans chapter 10, verse 15, And how shall they preach except they be sent, as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. And Gentile and Jew are made one as a result of this peace, as we see in Ephesians chapter 2. The middle wall of partition had been broken down. In Romans chapter 16, verse 25 and verse 26, now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God and made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. Paul reveals in Romans 16, that the gospel was a mystery at one time. It was kept secret since the beginning of the world. Oh, it was revealed a different time in parts and angels and prophets didn't even understand what it was either. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 through 20, Peter stated, for as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. We were redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, he says. But it was planned out. It was foreordained before the world was ever created. Jesus, the Lamb of God, was slain in the mind of God before creation. In Revelation 13, 8, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, who? Jesus whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Yes, God had a plan before he ever created man to save mankind, and that's through Jesus Christ. The good news, the gospel of Jesus, that is the gospel of God. That is the good news of God to save mankind, that man could be one, that man could have peace one with another in the body of Jesus Christ which is the church. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7 and 8, Paul revealed <coughs> excuse me, that if the princes of the world had understood, they would have never crucified Jesus. But we speak the wisdom of God in the mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. God had a plan to save mankind. The plan originated in eternity, carried out in the mind of God in eternity. 
that man could be one, could have redemption, could have forgiveness of sins, could be part of God's family. The gospel is the power of God and the salvation. There is no other power under heaven that we can be saved. When he says the power of God and salvation, it is the same word for, F-O-R, in Acts 2, verse 38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Whatever for the remission of sins means, in Acts 2, 38, unto salvation means the same thing. That word, unto, means the same thing as the word for. The power of God, which is the gospel, saves man. <coughs> Excuse me. When one repents, is baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, it's in order to receive remission of sins. Acts 2, verse 38. If the gospel, the gospel of peace, if the gospel is the power of God into salvation, what does this tell me? It tells me I've got a problem. I'm not saved. But all of us have a problem. As we stand before God upon our own merit. For you see in Romans chapter 3, verse 9 and verse 10, Paul says, are we better than they? Are the Jews better than the Gentiles? He says, no, in no wise. For we have proved both Jew and Gentile that they are all under sin. And it is, is, as it is written, there's none righteous. No, not one. Then verse 23, for we all have sinned and come short, fallen short of the glory of God of God. That's me. That's you. And it just takes one sin. And we all have sinned. There's none of us good enough to get to heaven on our own. And that's why we need the grace of God in our lives today. And in fact, Romans 6.23 tells us that as the result of our sin, the wages that we earn is death. Eternal death. The positive thing is, is that there is a free gift. And that free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus. The gospel, that's the good news. Well, what has God done for me? What has God done for you? What has God done for man? Well, first of all, as we look at the book of Romans, which we're studying the road to heaven, as Paul gives us in Romans, Christ died. He died for me. He died for you. He left heaven, gave up heaven, and came to earth and lived as a man and died for us. In Romans chapter 5, verse 6, <coughs> excuse me. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Verse 8. But God committeth, God demonstrated his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When we were unlovable, when we were his enemies, when we were ungodly, when we were sinners, Christ died for us. The second thing, he was resurrected from the grave. In Romans chapter 1, verse 4, and declared to be the Son of God with power, referring to Jesus, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Romans chapter 4, verse 24. But for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. Romans chapter 6, verse 9. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. And Romans chapter 8. Verse 11, 
But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. This is the good news, that God cared enough for us to allow Jesus to come to earth, to send his only begotten son to die for us. And then he was resurrected from the grave. Then we know that he ascended into heaven. In Romans chapter 8, verse 34, who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God. So in that one verse, it establishes the previous two facts, and as a third fact, he died. And he was resurrected. He rose again. And then he ascended into heaven and is sitting on the right hand of God today. Why did he do all this? For me, for you. So that we could be saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ. A problem we have in the world today is that people do not go to the right source for the answer to our question, how to be saved, how to have a right relationship with God, how we can have forgiveness of sins. And they have the wrong answer, and they do not obey the gospel. On the other hand, there are those who go to the right source, hear the gospel, and they do not obey it. I want you to notice Romans chapter 10, verse 16. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed, I report. He said, even though they heard the good news, they didn't, all of them didn't believe the gospel, the message, and they did not obey it. So you've got to believe it before you can obey it. I ask you today, do you believe the gospel, the good news of what Jesus has done for us? The Son of God coming to earth, dying, buried, resurrected, ascended into heaven after his resurrection, interceding on our behalf? Have you obeyed that gospel? So let's compare what Paul wrote by inspiration in the book of Romans, how a person responds to the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ to receive forgiveness of sins and compare it to what Jesus stated that we looked at a couple of weeks ago. The first thing Jesus said, you've got to hear. He said, I say unto you, he that heareth my word, John 5, verse 24, and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. So we've got to believe the word that Jesus spoke. In Romans 10, verse 13 and 14, listen to the words along this road to salvation in the book of Romans. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall I call on him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? He says, belief is necessary, but he says, how can they believe without hearing? Hearing comes before believing. Hearing about what Jesus has done for us. Secondly, we are to believe. In John 8, 24, unless you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. Paul wrote on this road to salvation. As we notice in Romans 10, 14, just a minute ago, how then shall I call on him, him in whom they have not believed? We can't call on anyone that we don't believe in. That's what he's saying. In Romans 10, verse 9, <coughs> Paul stated that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Notice, believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead. If you believe from your heart that he raised him from the dead, guess what? You believe that he died. 
you believe that he lived. So yes, Paul is in total agreement with what Jesus said. They are not at odds with one another. Jesus said, except a man repent, he shall likewise perish. Luke 13, verse 3, verse 5. What did Paul wrote on this road to heaven, as we see in the book of Romans? <coughs> Excuse me. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? Don't you understand that the long suffering of God, the patience of God is for your repentance? This goodness of God ought to lead you to repentance. Without repentance, we're not on that road to salvation. Totally in agreement what Jesus stated. And we are to confess Jesus before others. We're to confess our belief. Jesus said, if we will confess him before others, he'll confess us before his Father, which is in heaven, Matthew 10, 32. I want you to listen very carefully now. We're going to spend a couple of minutes on Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 13. Because these scriptures are so misapplied and misunderstood today. He says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you notice verse 13, we need to recognize that salvation is for those who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The subjects of this salvation is whosoever. The Gentiles, as well as the Jews, it did not matter, whosoever. For salvation is for all men. In Acts chapter 2, verse 21, Peter even stated on the day of Pentecost, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. In Acts 2.39, For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. We've got to be called by God. We're called by the gospel of Jesus Christ. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14. But then again, we've got to call on the name of the Lord. Acts 2.21, Romans 10, verse 13. So what is implied in calling on the name of the Lord? It's the cry of someone in need. It is the recognition of one's inability to save himself. To call upon God, to call upon him, to call upon our Lord is begging him for aid, for help, for salvation. It does not mean simply calling on the name of of the Lord, and it does not simply mean to pray. For an example, Matthew 7, 21 and 22. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works. Here's people calling on the name of the Lord on the day of judgment. I never knew you. Never knew you. Depart from me, you, you workers of iniquity. Oh, we've done many wonderful things for you, Lord. I never knew you. 
To call on the name of the Lord means to call on him his way, not my way, not on my terms, not the way I think that I ought to call on him, but the way that he wants to be called upon. It means to seek God in a way he prescribes. If someone says, God and I have an arrangement, you can go to the bank, they're lost. They don't have a right relationship with God. We don't get in an arrangement with God and bargain with God. God sets the boundaries. He sets the laws himself. He's told us how he wants to be called upon. And I can't call upon him any other way. And it involves carrying out the will of God in my life. That's what calling on the name of the Lord means. <coughs> The second thing I want you to understand is in these section of verses, salvation is for those who confess Jesus as Lord with their mouth. And this coincides with what we conclude in verse 13. Paul is urging his readers to confess with their mouths what is already in their heart that they believe. So what is he saying? He's saying belief is not enough. People run to this and say, as long as you believe it, no, 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 no. That's not what the scripture says. He is saying that belief is not enough. Confession, as well as belief, as well as other things, are of a necessity to be acceptable unto God. Because how do I know that? Because what are we confessing? We're confessing the Lord. Jesus, what does that mean? What does it mean to me? As I look in the Bible, and the Bible explains what Lord means. It means I have submitted my heart, my life, my being, my actions unto him. He is Lord of my life. I'm just confessing. What I already believe, what is in my heart. It is more than just words. As we looked at Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. This scripture is stressing that justification comes to the believer rather than to the earner, the one trying to earn his. The reference made in these verses are from Deuteronomy chapter 30. The book of Deuteronomy has been called the glorious sermon on the love of God. It stresses that man should respond to God from the heart and in love. To love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul. I like to say, with every part of my being. <coughs> and if I love God the way that God wants me to love him, guess what God gets for me? Everything that he wants. And that's my heart. That's my life. If I love him, I will follow him. Isn't that what Jesus said in John 14, verse 23? If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Listen very carefully. If I call on the name of the Lord, if I confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus and do not obey Jesus, I am being inconsistent. Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? Luke 6, verse 46 is what Jesus asked. So when you look at what Jesus said and what Paul wrote, to the book of Romans on this Roman road to salvation. He has said exactly the same thing that Jesus said. And then we come to baptism. Jesus said in John 3, men must be born in water and the spirit to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Mark 16, he that believeth and baptized shall be saved. What did Paul write? In Romans chapter 6, Verse 3, verse 4, remember what God did for us, what Jesus did for us. He died, was buried, and he was resurrected. That's the heart of the gospel message. That's the good news. 
Now listen to what Paul writes. Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his, number one, his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. So we're baptized in death. Secondly, we're buried with him in baptism. That like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Third thing Jesus did was resurrection from the dead, and we're resurrected out of that watery grave of baptism. Because that old man's been crucified. That old man died and was buried. And we are raised to walk in that new life. Why? Because we are a new creation. Second Corinthians 5. With a new master, a new life, a new hope, with forgiveness of sins in our lives. In Romans 10, verse 15 and 16, I want you to leave, I want to leave you with these two verses. And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? See, it made sense to Isaiah that if they believed, they would be obey. They would obey. Doesn't that make sense? So the question I raise today, if we are believers in Christ, and if we have confessed what is in our heart, the Lord Jesus, well, why haven't we repented of our sins? Why haven't we been baptized into Christ so that we can have the forgiveness of sins? So my question today is, do you believe? If you don't, why? Why? And if you believe, have you obeyed? Have you obeyed Jesus? Have you obeyed the death, the burial, the resurrection? Have you obeyed the way that Jesus has told us? Have you obeyed the way that we looked at in the book of Acts when people wanted to know what they needed to do to be saved and were told, if we obeyed that way and if we obeyed the way that Paul has told us on this road to heaven from the book of Romans, I pray that you have. And if you haven't, I pray that you will. Don't hesitate. Don't put it off. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. Today is the day of salvation. Let's love God more and more each day. And let's continue to grow in that grace and knowledge of Jesus. Thank you.